It's Sunny, welcome back to my channel. I've gotten like questions and comments of people asking whether or not they need to read Shadow and Bone before reading Six of Crows. So I thought that I would make a video that I wish that I had before I started reading the Grishaverse books. This is all my opinion, by the way, but the simple answer to this is that you can read Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom before reading Shadow and Bone because that is exactly what I did. I read Six of Crows and I read Crooked Kingdom before I even touched any of the original Grishaverse books. And these became my favorite books of all time. This is gonna be controversial. I actually think that you should read this before reading Shadow and Bone. Um, Leigh Bardugo wrote these after the original trilogy, so her writing is uh, 8 million times better, let me tell you, okay? Recently, literally like this year, this year I read the original trilogy for the first time because of the Netflix Shadow and Bone adaptation. I read Shadow and Bone and then I read Siege and Storm and then I reread these two books and then I read Ruin and Rising. It was only during the reread that I picked up on things in these books that literally went straight over my head the first time that I read them because I didn't know anything about Shadow and Bone, characters and cameos who show up. So I kind of had like a both perspective. But yeah, in this video, I'm going to go over everything that you need to know, all like the relevant things from Shadow and Bone that might give you like a little bit of a helping hand when you're reading Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom. But like I said, you don't have to. I'll tell you everything that you need to know and you can just read this and just have a fun time. Okay, so Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom is the companion duology to the original Shadow and Bone trilogy. And it takes place two years after the events of the final book. Let me talk about the world first. Let's talk about the Grishas. Grisha are what people with special magical abilities are called. You can kind of imagine them as like like benders from Avatar. There's different classes of them. So the first type are called the Corporalki. Corporalki is like everything to do with the body. So within the Corporalki, we have heart renders and heart renders are able to like, like make a couple changes to the body and it's like, they're kind of able to like break the body, if that makes sense. Then we have healers who are able to heal the body and we have tailors. They're able to make like small like physical changes, like appearance wise. And then we have our second class, which are called the Ethereal keys. Within ethereal keys, we have squalors. Squalors are able to manipulate the air and like storms. And then we have inferni who are able to manipulate fire. And then tide makers who are able to manipulate like water. And then the third class is material guy. And they're also called fabricators. There are classes within this one too, but honestly, they're not that important. Um, are able to manipulate like specific materials like metals and stuff like that. So that's like the Grisha magic system. Okay, let's talk about important characters. The main character in Shadow and Bone is a girl named Alina. She discovers that she is like a special rare type of Grisha called a sun summoner. She's like the only one of her kind. Exactly what it sounds like, she's able to summon light, like sunlight. The reason that that is so important is because the villain of the Shadow and Bone trilogy is someone named the Darkling and he's like the exact opposite. He can summon darkness. The only thing that you need to know about that storyline is the fact that the Darkling is defeated. Final, final battle in like the third book. Alina fakes her her death to become a martyr. Because of that, she became a saint and in this world they call saints Sancta. So the reason that this is significant is because Alina became like such a symbol of hope within this entire land. And since that point, everybody always says Sancta Alina, Sancta Alina. So every time they say Sancta Alina or they mention something about Alina, that's who they're talking about. Um, you'll hear mention of someone named Zoya. One of the characters in Six of Crows, Nina. When we learn about her backstory, we hear about Zoya a lot. Because Zoya is a squalor who showed up in Shadow and Bone. And she eventually became like a very, very, very famous Grisha, teaches other Grisha. So Zoya is Nina's mentor. Um, in Crooked Kingdom, you'll hear about someone named Sturmhund, like Captain Sturmund. Captain Sturmund is the secret identity of someone named Nikolai, and he's the prince of Ravka. He lives like a secret double life as captain named Sturmhund. And very few people know that it's actually Nikolai because he has someone tailor his appearance so that he looks a little bit different so nobody recognizes that it's Prince Nikolai. Um, and the main thing is that they alter his nose. Every time in this book that people look at Sturmhund and they're like, there's something weird about his face, something weird about his nose. He keeps turning his face away. It's because of that. It's the original Shadow and Bone trilogy all takes place in a nation called Ravka. Grisha and humans kind of coexist. People are tested to see if they're Grisha and if they are, then they're recruited into like a special armor, a special school just for Grisha. That is where Nina is from. Six of Crows takes place on this island that's across the sea from Ravka called Kerch. And within Kerch, it takes place in a city called Ketterdam. Ketterdam is the crustiest city you'll ever- Think like Peaky Blinders from Netflix, you know? It's like that kind of vibe. One of the main characters in Six of Crows, that's where Kaz grew up. And then there is like a nation to the north of Ravka called Fierda. 
them. I think of this as like the tundra type nation. Like it's really, really snowy, really, really cold. That is where Matthias, another one of our main characters, is from. In Fierda, the Grisha are persecuted. It's kind of like a Salem witch hunt. And then another one of our main characters named Inej is Suli. And the Suli are a group of like nomadic people also from Ravka. It says here that they're inspired by Roma and South Asian cultures. Oh, she grew up like learning acrobatics and doing things like in traveling caravans. And then our last main character is Jesper and he's from a place called Novi Zem. And it says here that Novi Zem is known for its dark skinned people, its frontiers, bustling coastal cities, extensive farmland where Jurda is cultivated and sophisticated firearms. But I remember when I was reading this, I was like, what are these places? <laughs> Hopefully that gives some clarification when you read this. Like I said, you don't need to have read the original Shadow and Bone trilogy to read this. All of the little pieces of information that I didn't know about Shadow and Bone before I read this, it doesn't really take away the reading experience if you don't understand all the references. But if you do want to understand them, I just said everything that you need to know and then you'll understand the references. So hopefully that was helpful. Oh wait, I forgot about this. This is a, a place called Shuhan, um, which will also become relevant, but I think that Shuhan is like supposed to be inspired by East Asia. So yeah, obviously I would highly, highly recommend this duology. Don't let the original trilogy deter you from reading this. You absolutely don't need to invest your time into that trilogy if you don't want to. The worst case scenario, all of the references that you don't understand are just gonna go straight over your head and it's gonna be fine. Stay safe and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.